Audio recording for this meeting has begun. Hello, everyone. On behalf of AgriLink, Feed the Future, and USA's Bureau for Food Security, I would like to welcome you to our webinar today on Investing for Our Development, Supporting Private Investment for Inclusive and Sustainable Agriculture-Led Economic Growth. My name is Janet Lawson, and I am an Agriculture Development Officer currently serving in USA's Bureau for Food Security. Before we dive into the content, I'd like to go over a few items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourselves, ask questions, and share resources. We love for our webinars to be interactive. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. The speakers will also answer some questions in the chat box along the way. You'll see that the slides are available for download in the box on the left of your screen, as well as the three agriculture investment primers that we will be discussing today. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will email you the recording, transcript, and additional resources once they are ready. They'll also be posted on AgriLink. Great, let's launch into the heart of the webinar. Agricultural finance and investment, especially commercial investment by the private sector, is a core driver of economic growth and development. Investment in farms, enterprises, and households drive broader structural transformation and are crucial for reducing poverty. Approximately 86% of people living in rural areas in developing countries depend on agriculture to some extent for their livelihoods. Agriculture contributes to 68% of employment in low-income countries. According to the World Bank, growth in the agriculture sector, which depends upon financing investment, is two to three times more effective at reducing the number of people in poverty than equivalent growth in other sectors. Agriculture investment is crucial to achieve the goals of Feed the Future to improve food security and resilience, particularly in the face of population growth and climate change. Over the past five and a half years, USA's Investment Support Program, ISP, has been working to catalyze investment opportunities, mobilize private capital, and deepen private and financial sector engagement. USAID missions have undertaken approximately 100 investment support activities, primarily in the agriculture sector. These range from value chain assessments and market analyses to sector mapping. These activities have contributed to achieving objectives of Feed the Future by stimulating policy change, identifying investment opportunities, and strengthening capacity of missions and host government agencies to facilitate investment for development impact. Based on these experiences working to strengthen agricultural investment, USA developed a series of three primers that identify concrete steps to support agriculture investment and development. These primers are intended to walk the user through identification of investment opportunities, addressing barriers to investment, and engaging investors and investees to catalyze successful agriculture investment. We are happy also to receive any feedback on the primers as to how they may be improved and incorporate that. The webinar will start off by showcasing the primers that have been developed to support USAID and its partners in facilitating private sector investment for inclusive and sustainable agriculture-led academic growth. The team will also share an approach to investment opportunity identification and facilitation, and also highlight key lessons learned drawing on the experiences of ISP. To start off, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Afua Sarkodi. Afua is the current team leader for USA's Investment Support Program and a partner at Zalberg. She brings 18 years of experience working with private sector partnerships and investment mobilization in the agriculture sector to achieve its development goals. She'll start off by introducing our speakers. Afwa, please take it away. Thank you, Janet. And good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, and thrilled to be here today. So on the line, on behalf of the Investment Support Program, we have a team from Dahlberg Advisors. And so I would firstly like to introduce Carline Norvin. Now, Carline is one of our partners based in Dahlberg's Johannesburg office and also leads our inclusive business growth practice. She has spent much of uh, the duration of the investment support program working side by side with USAID missions on 
market selection, market entry, product identification and commercialization opportunities. This includes working with missions in Malawi, Rwanda, Niger, and Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone, just to name a few. Our next speaker that we have on the line is CJ Fonzi. CJ is a partner and office director of our Kigali office based in Rwanda. Similarly, he has spent much of ISP working closely with the Rwanda mission and others on their agriculture commercialization and investment facilitation activities. This includes a very um, embedded set of activities with Rwanda's National Agricultural Export Board and the Rwanda Development Board to actively promote, promote investment in particular value chains and products identified. Our last presenter today is John Basley. He's one of our managers based in DC and has been instrumental in helping pull together these primers, which have involved looking across ISP support over the last five years, engaging with different activity managers across USA missions and with the team at BFS to ensure that they are fit for purpose and useful for not only for the agency, but for the sector more broadly. And so with that, I would like to hand over um, briefly to John to talk through the primers that we've developed and a bit about the methodology and how we got there. Thank you, Afua. So we landed on <clears throat> three individual primers that each seek to focus uh, on separate core issues relating to uh, driving investment support. The first primer looks to identify sectors and products with potential for commercial scale investment. So it's really the technical steps of the process. And it's how to navigate investment filtering process from generating a long list of subsectors with high commercial and social impact potential to identifying specific, useful, and viable investment opportunities. The second focus is on the enabling environment, which is mapping and addressing those barriers that limit investment and helping to shape uh, the enabling environment itself. It seeks to identify and address those barriers that limit investment, identify the deal breakers for investment opportunities, and provide guidance on how USA admissions can help implement policy. The third one is, is around relationship building, around engaging investors and investees around these prioritized opportunities. The objectives are to give guidance on how USA admissions can uh, appraise the private sector stakeholder ecosystem uh, and how to approach and pitch opportunities to like-minded private sector organizations. In conducting this analysis, we engaged with uh, dozens of uh, prior ISP uh, work that we've done over the past five years, drawing out the lessons and insights to inform our uh, uh, approaches, uh, refining common themes, and distilling a list of guiding principles. We also validated that and got further with it from uh, a range of activity managers and uh, thereafter fine-tune those lessons uh, with the BFS team to really drive towards uh, a pithy, synthesized version that would uh, be useful to, to drive forward uh, investor support. To bring this to life, I'm going to hand over to CJ to uh, provide an overview Great, of Great, thanks, John, of and uh, good Wanda evening, everyone, uh, from, from Kigali. So really excited to, to talk through the work that, that we've done here um, under the Investment Support Program. And uh, it's, it, I'm going to take you back about 18 months. And, and we began this process um, roughly halfway, a little bit more than that, sort of in, in, our, in our later days um, of implementation of ISP. And it's a process that we designed and we developed based on many of the learnings that we had early on through ISP. Um, and the question that was asked was, how can we identify high value commercial investment opportunities in Rwanda? And we began working with the mission to say, well, let's think through where those might be. And we, we, we started in actually a, a somewhat unscientific process um, of generating hypotheses. We said, where, what value chains do we think could be potentially 
um, potentially viable for commercial investment in Rwanda. And we, we had a conversation with the USAID mission, with a few other experts. Um, we went through Dalberg's portfolio of work and we came back and we said, we've seen a lot of activity in high value agriculture, high value horticulture products exporting to Europe. Um, that cross-checked um, around uh, trends we saw in the market with increased demand in Europe for these things um, and with um, sort of uh, some limitations in some of the, the markets that we're currently feeding them. And so <clears throat> we, at, at that point, we said, well, let's look. You know, we see some small businesses. Let's, let's, let's run an effort to understand whether there are commercially viable opportunities here. Um, and we, we began an engagement um, that ran about three months where we looked at a, a range of value chains. You see them here on the slide, snow peas, passion fruit, chilies, mushrooms, macadamia, farmed fish, avocado, and pineapple. And we said, let's, let's understand these. And, and based on looking at where we saw some early pioneers, some small, and these were small businesses, businesses maybe crossing the million dollars a year in revenue, um, beginning to export. Um, we, we said, let's, let's look at these guys. And so, so we, we really sought to understand whether there's a business case for these value chains. And what we did was we looked at the markets they were going to and said, what is, what is the demand in these markets and what is the value of these things in these markets? We looked at where we sit in Rwanda and we, we said, what is, what is possible? Not, not what are the economics of businesses currently working here, but what are the economics of businesses that, um, that could work here? And so we use many of the pioneers and small businesses in the value chains as examples, but we also looked at leading exporters globally of, you know, for example, Chile to understand the economics of Chile. Through that, we were able to put together a good solid understanding of what it would cost to produce and export these value chains from Rwanda and get them to Europe. Um, and then what we discovered is some were viable and not surprisingly, some weren't. Um, we found that, for example, passion fruit, one of the best places in the world to grow it is Rwanda. There's increasing demand in Europe. Um, we can get the direct links uh, to Europe and we can do it profitably. Um, <clears throat> we were. We, we then moved to a phase where we looked at the ROI for some of these, and it was indeed quite positive uh, for, for passion fruit. Um, farmed fish, for example, didn't work. Um, we looked at farmed fish, we looked at what it would cost to produce it here, and the challenge that we had was we didn't have access to the inputs necessary for fish feed. And so we had to, we had to take the sober analysis that farmed fish probably wasn't going to be right for investment in Rwanda. Um, Macadamia you see in yellow was an interesting one. Uh, the, the returns could be quite high, but you're looking at 12 to 15 years before you see those returns. We didn't think we'd be able to attract a commercial investor into that space. So once we understood which value chains made sense, we moved on to a process of identifying potential business models. Um, and so there we're not just looking at the commodity, but we need to look at the entire value chain. So everything from inputs to primary production, to transport and logistics and ultimately uh, sales and marketing. And we were able to, to define uh, with six business models that we thought made sense across a range of these value chains. Um, we then uh, wrapped up that project, produced a report that I think was very valuable in the market, uh, but we didn't stop there. We began working with the mission there to say, how do we um, actually promote these investments? How do we make sure that we can bring in actors to, to actually fulfill this business potential? And so that had us partnering with the National Agriculture Export Board here in Rwanda and Rwanda Development Board, a government agency focused on investment promotion. And we, we took a team that actually sat there and worked parallel with some of our public sector uh, counterparts to take these business models and bring them to the market. And the team went to conferences, the team did a lot of research and one-on-one -on -one outreach, the team went to Kenya where there were some existing operators with similar business models and began to really promote Rwanda as, as a place to do these things. Um, coming out, I think we had uh, a, a long list of 10 or 12 potential opportunities, um, and we had four or five that we felt quite certain would happen. Um, 
These are new investments, either bringing new operators into the country or bringing commercial capital into the country to scale these. Uh, one I'm particularly excited about is a logistics company uh, that looks like they're going to come in here and begin to run quite a bit of air freight handling, uh, both airport side and on the other side, to ensure that we can really get the quality we need to get these products to market. Um, so that's that's a brief view um, of what we did here, but hopefully it'll give some context to uh, the opportunities that we looked at across a range of these products. and profitable enough to absorb sizable amounts of capital. So typically we're thinking three to $5 million with about a seven to 10 year exit timeline, because that is what commercial investors look at. There may be many opportunities in countries for profitable smaller businesses or smaller site activities that may yield livelihoods for people, but that may not be ready to absorb this amount of investment capital. So the focus of these primers really is looking at um, things that are ready for that type of investment capital to then drive um, further sector growth and livelihood growth. So there's fundamentally three steps uh, in selecting sectors and products, as you see here on this slide. Um, the first is generating a long list of products, then shortlisting high potential products slash sectors, and then uh, distilling business models and business cases um, around shortlisted products. So in the first step, generating the long list of products, there's actually a step even before that um, where we define what are we looking to do with these sectors of products? Fundamentally, who are we trying to sell to? Are uh, we looking at increasing domestic consumption? Are we looking at promoting regional exports or intercontinental exports? And domestic consumption can come from um, substituting imports or from autonomous growth within the country. And it's important to make that distinction early on because serving each of these markets is quite different. And the standards you need to meet and the competition you need to beat will be quite different for each of these different markets. And as CJ was talking about the Rwanda example, he explained that in Rwanda, we look very much at exporting to Europe and um, the Middle East because of the size of the Rwandan market and the potential margins that can be had uh, and therefore sector development and, and economic growth that can be achieved when you sell into those higher paying mar uh, markets. But some of the other countries we did this work in there was a lot of potential, for example, for import substitution. So that's the first thing you do. Then you generate a long list of value chains of products. And as CJ mentioned when we did this in Rwanda, that is not a super scientific process. Um, it should not take a lot of the resources because remember what we're trying to do here, it's finding viable opportunities, not necessarily the best possible opportunities. Very important at this stage to not make perfect the enemy of good. And the way that we have come up with these lists on multiple occasions is to actually look at things that people think are quite likely and things that they've always been wondering about or wild cards of products and services that they would they, they think might work um, but, but would like to see tested at some stage. In the second step, when you have that long list, um, we shortlist towards high potential products and sectors. And doing that follows quite a rigorous economic analysis, whereby we look at what we call deal breakers. So at that phase, you try to very explicitly ask yourself, why would this not work? Instead of how, what could I possibly do to make this work? And that's an important lens because investors and we realized this also when we did the work with the rwandan investors later on investors tend to want to come to the table when they invest when they have a relatively large amount of control over the outcome if first 20 things need to change from 
better infrastructure to access to land, to changed farming practices, to um, different tax laws, and all of those need to change before something becomes commercially viable, investors will be very hesitant to move forward because they don't control all of those things and it's not attractive for them to move in. So when we do this analysis of potential deal breakers, we look at the ability of products to beat the competition for customers and to be attractive enough for investment capital and to be better use of productive resources than other things that uh, one can do. So CJ gave examples of the first two already when he spoke about uh, the Rwanda example. For example, the farmed fish was very hard to beat the competition um, and uh, for the macadamia, the investment case was only really working on a very long timeline, which made you tap into different types of capital. An example of the of the last um, test, so so competing for the productive resources, was some flower seeds, which we looked at um, both in Tanzania as well as in Malawi. And in Tanzania, this was a really good opportunity opportunity uh, for farmers because their um, default um, option was maize and sunflower could earn them two to three, three times as much as, as the maize per year. But in Malawi, the default option, at least for now, was tobacco. Uh, and that earned them a lot more than sunflower seeds. So that meant that in Malawi, sunflower, as much as maybe it could be an interesting industry for the farmers that could grow tobacco, it would actually be a deterioration of their livelihood. Um, so those are the uh, criteria that you use for shortlisting products uh, and sectors. And then you move towards the business models, as, as CJ mentioned in um, the Rwanda example. It's, it's not enough to say, well, passion fruit is really interesting. You then move towards, OK, what's in passion fruit? Um, so it could, for, for example, be a vertically integrated operation in passion fruit that works with an anchor farm and then an outgrower scheme and uh, packages and exports to Europe. That is a business model and could be a business case. Uh, in some other instances, we say, no, it's something cross-cutting in um, cold chain or in transport, uh, or it is actually in a particular crop, just the production with an outgrower model, not the whole vertically integrated activity because exporting can be done by somebody else. And it's important to identify that because investors will want to think about a specific opportunity that they could um, could start latching onto rather than just broadly a, a product. Important um, guiding principles to keep in mind when you do this um, are on this page here in front of you. And I've spoken to many of them already implicitly, but let's walk through them quickly. So the first is make sure that you take a business approach to honestly evaluating competitiveness of products and value chains. Um, it, th there, is, there are a lot of products that, for example, can grow really well in a particular country, but if you cannot sell them as cheaply as another country to particular customers, for example, overseas, you will not be able to sell those products because many of these are commodities. So um, it is very important to take that lens, otherwise you would be investing in a product that doesn't have a market, and that can actually have real negative consequences. It's entirely possible to move into new products and value chains. Um, so a great example of that is the cut flower industry that uh, rose to prominence in both Ethiopia and Kenya in just a few years from almost nothing because it was so like everything came, came together in a really good way. Um, but just because something already exists does not mean that you can expand it. Um, there was an interesting example in Malawi where there is a fish farm in Lake Malawi that is selling um, high-end locally farmed fish to um, a high-end set of customers. And that market was saturated. While Malawians do eat a lot of fish, they tend to eat wild-caught fish or cheaply imported fish, none of which the farmed fish could compete with from a price perspective. 
So whilst there was a flourishing fish farm already, it couldn't just expand because at its price point, it had saturated the market. It's also highly unlikely that if you can't um, compete in the basic segment, that you will be able to beat whoever you can't compete with just by becoming organic and fair trade or made in fill in the blank. So the example of Rwanda, um, it's hard for Rwanda to be competitive in anything that needs to be shipped because it's a landlocked country. So avocados and pineapples didn't work there. Um, and you can't just say, oh, I'm going to do fair trade avocados and pineapple, and then I'm going to win the competition with, for example, Tanzania or Kenya, because they can also do fair trade avocado or pineapple. So it's, it's, it's important to continue taking that clear business lens. Also very important to focus explicitly on only addressing the most pressing binding constraints. Private sector actors can solve for a lot of things themselves and can make a lot of things work. So it's not necessarily needed to do a full value chain analysis and identify all things that are that could possibly be um, resolved to make it better. It's important to solve the one or two things that really stand in the way of this being viable and then the market can solve for a lot of things itself. Lastly, being mindful of, of potential unintended negative externalities is really important. So that all I need to do is point back to the sunflower example in Malawi. If you hadn't looked at that from a pharma perspective, you might have pushed something that is viable, but um, uh, uh, actually does not improve the livelihood for farmers. So that's that's what's the first um, first primer covers. The second primer then moves towards mapping and addressing the barriers that limit investment, specifically from a policy perspective. Um, so once we have identified that a product or sector is in principle very viable, there might still be um, policy or regulatory constraints that make that really hard. Be it, for example, challenges to secure access to land at big enough a scale to actually make a commercially viable investment um, or a particular ta taxation setup that disadvantages the uh, emergence of particular businesses. So this process happens sort of parallel to the previous one. Once you have identified a, a, a sector in that uh, or a product in that process of identifying business models, as we saw two pages back, in the in, in step 1.3 you also start looking at the um the policy constraints so here you see uh four steps which follow a really logical flow scanning the policy landscape around the opportunity so looking at the policy from the lens of the product or service that you have identified identifying key binding constraints and it's again the same sort of self-censoring almost as we had in the previous primer only look at the things that truly stand in the way of unlocking this. So there may be many things that could make it better, but what is the one thing that really stands in the way of unlocking this? Um, then based on that, you can set recommendations to overcome that and enhance investments. And importantly, don't stop at the recommendation stage that, you know, we, we probably many of us know working on these topics, um, the theoretical questions have been answered many, many times, but it's, it often breaks down in the implementation. So it is, um, it is important to actually see that through. Just to bring this to life with an example, um, we did work on the edible oil sector in Tanzania, uh, where Tanzania, like many African countries, imports a lot of its edible oil, um, and particularly palm oil. But Tanzania is quite well positioned itself to grow sunflower oil and to, to grow sunflower seeds and process that into sunflower oil. As the industry stood when we started doing this work, sunflower oil was fundamentally not cost competitive with the palm oil. So it was just more expensive. And even though people had a, a, a preference for having sunflower oil over palm oil, they couldn't pay the price premium. And the government had tried to address that by putting an import duty on the palm oil. But what that had led to was actually the palm oil was more expensive and the sunflower oil was actually still not competitive because the, the duty wasn't high enough. One could up the palm oil duty even further, but this is obviously an important commodity for people and you don't want to just solve it by making imports that's unaffordable. 
So we started looking at it and we found out that if you processed it in a different way, not artisanally mechanical pressing at a small scale, but an industrial process called chemical um, uh, solvent extraction, um, then you could actually make sunflower oil at price competitive in Tanzania. And it actually did not need uh, a sustained import duty on the palm oil, but it did need that duty to stay for a bit whilst the sector picked up. So when we started doing this work, there was a lively debate about should we keep or remove this import duty because it has increased the cost for people and it doesn't seem to have unlocked our sunflower industry. And there were strong voices to actually remove the duty, which would have made it really hard for the local industry to actually pick up. Um, so the outcome of our work was, no, 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 you, you need to actually keep that in place for a little bit more so that the industry can pick up. But many of the other things that the government was focused on, policy and support, were not as critical. They were working a lot with smallholder farmers on, on a whole bunch of things, which actually the industry could resolve by itself, and they weren't the binding constraints. So that's a nice example of where sort of identifying that binding constraint and then being really thoughtful about solving it um, can help shepherd such an investment opportunity along. Um, I see from the corner of my eye, a lot of questions are pouring in. Uh, we have only a few more, more slides to go through and then we'll, we'll cover many of your questions, hopefully. So the guiding principles on this second primer that talks about the policy constraints are on this page here, as you see, again, do not try to be comprehensive in the problems you seek to solve, but be very, very, very focused. So be very specific about the solution, um, solve only the binding constraint, and that might mean that you need to be very, very tactical in how you approach it. Obviously, an alignment with local and national strategies um, and using an investment opportunity as an avenue to drive progress will yield much more smooth and faster results because you can find the common ground and you can find sort of the alignment across various different stakeholders. That does require, obviously, early, close and dedicated stakeholder engagement. Um, to make sure that you know all the various different perspectives and people also understand why you may or may not be focusing on their part of the equation, um, which also naturally comes with a need to understand the context before you design the intervention. Then the third and last primer that we developed is about, okay, once you have these business opportunities, these business models, these potential investment um, opportunities and you have aligned that there are no more binding policy constraints, how do you actually then make that happen? Because it's one thing to say, here is an integrated um, passion fruit farm export business in Rwanda, that idea is a viable idea, it's another to actually get it off the ground. And we spent um, a fair amount of time in Rwanda, but also in a, in a bunch of other countries um, driving this process, and that basically comes down to these four steps you see on this page. <clears throat> the first is to actually um, understand the, the key actors in the space, so the key private investors and investees. And really important in that we realized is to look at operators. Um, there is actually not necessarily a shortage of investment capital. There's a lot of capital that wants to flow into this but can't find things to flow into. So if you speak to investors, they will say there aren't enough investable opportunities. And if you speak to businesses who are seeking capital, they will say there isn't enough capital. Um, what we're finding is that investors often need to have a credible operator on the ground. Because if I say today I'm going to start this you know, vertically integrated passion fruit farm and exporter in Rwanda, if I'm a capital provider, does that mean that I now go and employ people and set up a business and aggregate the land? That's not quite the role of an investor. In fact, the investor is looking for somebody who can run and operate that business who has some sort of credibility either with the markets or with the products. So one of the things we did in Rwanda then was for some of these products that were relatively new to Rwanda, we found regional um, operators that worked on those products or local operators that worked on similar products. 
and engaged with them and ask them, would you be willing to either come to Rwanda or when you're already in Rwanda, diversify to a slightly different product so that investors can work with you and you can together build out this business. So it's really that you have to go to quite a level of granularity in also identifying the actual actors and operators that could take this on. As the second step, um, very important to always keep in mind from a, from a, a development perspective, a USAID perspective, um, there might be investors and operators and investees that are less aligned with USAID's mission and objectives, and there, there may be some that are more aligned in terms of the uh, attention that they give to social inclusion or environmental considerations, etc. So you probably want to filter that and then reach out to those that you have prioritized to pitch multiple um, opportunities. And again, as with the uh, policy work, it doesn't stop at, the, at just the presenting or, or offering a solution. There is a need to often sort of see that through to the end, offer post-investment support and walk people to the deal and through the deal. So the last uh, slide on the primers I, I wanted to share with you are the guiding principles on, on this particular primer um, that you see on this page here. First one, it's important to recognize that private sector actors massively vary in type, context, and approach. Um, and it is important that you approach them with an understanding of what they are looking for, with an understanding of kind of the type of decision they're looking to make, because they, they will recognize that an investor isn't, in, isn't the same thing, <clears throat> regardless of focus or location that they're in. So it's important to engage early with them in a closed way and in a dedicated and very informed way. Know who they are beforehand and know what they are looking for so that you can start pitching things that, that are attractive to them and make sense to them. Even for so-called warm investors, so people that are already investing or have already decided to invest, um, um, engagement and facilitation are, are needed and need to be constant. What is important also as, a, as a, the, the fourth guiding principle here is to establish a shared big picture vision for the partnership at the outset. Many of these cases, even if investors have invested multiple times in a country, um, there's always something that is new about what we're trying to bring because we're trying to bring that additionality. So it may be a new type of product, it may be a new region in the country, which means that there are risks associated for everybody involved. It's a new relationship potentially, and that takes work to work through and it, it will have its hiccups. So starting with a shared big picture vision allows you to continue to have that conversation and relationship even when the going gets tough. And then the last one, overall partnership success can be enhanced by being purposeful about levering each partner's unique contribution and using you as a unique ability to broker relationships. Everybody brings something different to the table in these kind of relationship and building on, on the various strengths and thinking about what are all the pieces that we need to bring to the table. So I hope I answer it uh, as, the, as, the, as the person who asked the question um, uh, intended it. Um, so how to develop a shared value proposition? Um, I think the, the very important thing I find in all of these is to be able to walk in the shoes of each of the people that you are, each of the actors that you need to come to the table. Um, so an, a, a private, a commercial investor will be looking for certain things that is different from what the government is looking for, which is again different from what maybe the community or an operator is looking for. And as much as you want a shared vision, the way to get everybody excited is also to understand what it is each of them are looking for. And great. Um, for and people that have additional questions, please continue to put them in the chat box the, and uh, we'll respond to, to them as they can. Another type of access so and, I wanted to start with the first question. So, um, how do you develop shared value proposition uh, when you're designing 
investor and, an and, and have an opinion on what they're doing. Because we also care about social to the network of value chain actors. I have found in these question. kind of settings, Carlin, it's not necessarily would you like helpful to, take that? to start with judgment or start with trying to change what somebody's looking for. It is most helpful to start with understanding what makes them tick and then find how what you bring to the table can achieve that. I'm hoping I'm answering the question. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So um, actually, we have a very live project right now in northern Uganda, which um, only about 10 to 15 years ago achieved actual stability and peace after a decades long um, uh, a civil war. Um, and indeed, you mentioned we've also worked in, in Sierra Leone, Niger, Liberia, Guinea. Um, and it does require a slightly different approach, but the, the fundamentals are not all that different. So in northern Uganda, we are not surprisingly not finding that many opportunities that are ready to absorb this amount of capital. But we are finding businesses that thrive, that are profitable, and that are looking to grow, Please and that are really looking um, for our next question you know, the lowest end is maybe asking, a few thousand, um, a few have you focused any efforts in countries self-identifying? Of having billion. fragile contact and or setting. what we're doing there and also is really um, putting that in a context how do we create opportunities you, in these fragile contexts and settings. what can you I know imagine that this done, economy um, some work towards focusing on Niger, so, Sierra Leone, there Guinea. are many many Caroline, would you like to which are the ones in, on that in question? products or sectors that we can imagine become really big kernels of growth based on the same criteria that we use in in the more in the less fragile countries. So again, looking at, you know, if this product were grown at a really large scale, who would we sell it to and would we be, would we be good at that? So in northern Uganda is particularly well suited actually to um, serve South Sudan and the DRC. Um, and there is already a fair amount of uh, informal trade happening, but there are products that South Sudan is importing from other countries than Uganda that North Uganda could actually provide really well. So you look at that sort of macro lens first to look at products and, and, and services to, to charter the path towards um, transformative growth. And then you look at, well, what's currently there and how can we connect those two and how can you chart a path? So for Northern Uganda, the businesses we're finding right now, yeah, they're not ready to absorb that type of commercial investment capital, but if you then look at what are they looking for and how do investors break down, we found a pretty um, um, big and vibrant uh, diaspora community of that particular region that is looking to put some of their personal investment in there. So it's a different type of investment, but it's still very much anchored on what can be commercially viable and what can grow to a scale to ultimately transform that economy. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll reflect on it shortly and then I'll hand over to Afua, who's, done, who's doing a lot of our, our uh, gender work in agriculture. So um, when it comes to the inclusivity of business models, it's, um, it's, it's always a, a balance that you need to strike. On one hand, we wouldn't do any of this work if it wasn't driving inclusive economic growth, right? We're not interested in anything sort of for, for lack of a better word, exploitative. On the other hand, we do want to create something that holds as much commercial potential as possible for the investor that comes in. So where we often land is on some combination of, for example, an anchor farm that allows the investor to um, 
to um, deploy really uh, modern techniques. And we also have a question from Natalie. I'm um, asking about really inclusivity and business and models. Um, in assessing these different investment opportunities, is any effort made to investigate um, the potential impact of each of these identified opportunities on right gender relations and, and again, women's empowerment? The, the, uh, understanding Caroline, would you like to some investors, reflecting um, on that? find inclusivity way more important? So in areas where um, you can you can drive those kind of models, you you seek for those types of investors. But let me hand over to Afwa for the for the gender specific perspective in this. Thanks, Caroline. And just to add, I think you know it's a really valid point and something that we try to be really intentional about across all the work that we do. Um, so how can you apply a gender lens and what does that look like? And in the case of um, you know our agricultural work, and if we look at our whole host of engagements we've done under ISP, I think kind of three things we really focus on in this way. And first and foremost is when we're understanding the context, where possible, trying to use kind of sex disaggregated data to really draw out relevant gender gaps. So um, I think secondly, when it comes to the analytical approach and methodologies, where yeah. we are <laughs> able to deliver intentional so gender analysis at each stage, birthday, and, she's very and, young you know, and think and you about to where there might be gender gaps and um, why, <laughs> that's something we um, also strive yeah, so to do. On, and I think um, lastly, when it comes on, to on government and local government and how they're designed and delivered, um, it's, um, an you know, um, it's an interesting kind of question we've been sort of experimenting a few different um, uh, ways with. Because on one hand, you do want to anchor this approach very much in um, Everyone recognizes in a hard that kind of data is a constraint, um, and oftentimes you know, um, it's not always as straightforward and possible to do whatever I like, but that's the intention not that, kind that of we apply to, to our true. work. Um, it's true, it's not true, you can make adjustments, you can think about your business model, journey. but whether or not you can beat other Great. providers Thanks of that product that. or service into and market, we've had some questions about local governments and local partnerships. To um, that, at we have a question from Aviva. How are um, other local or government entities involved in the analysis or the investment promotion to, process? Um, what, if any, is the role of public sector in this work? Support, Maybe the CJ? Are that you can actually oh, find CJ's not on anymore. And you can okay. Some of those um, Carla, so typically, what we have done like is that. early on in the process, um, understand what the government priorities are, be it from uh, products and, and um, crops perspective, albeit from regions or types of interventions, inform them of the approach that we're taking. Then actually in our analysis, do the analysis in, a, in as, as um, quantitative and rigorous, rigorous a way as we, as we need to, and then frequently engage with them on the findings. So we're literally in this process right now in, in Sierra Leone and Guinea, where we started off engaging with the Ministry of Agriculture and a whole bunch of other actors to understand um, what their set of priorities is. We explained to them how we go about it. We went and did our analyses and then came back and explained uh, what we found. In some cases, we are finding that things that governments are um, really trying to uh, promote are not viable in the in uh, either not viable now or not viable in the way they thought about it or not viable at all. 
But in most cases, we actually also have ideas about things they might not have thought about that could be viable. So this was interesting in our conversations in Malawi, where some of the priority crops for the Ministry of Agriculture, we unfortunately had to say, we don't think that holds promise in international um, export, and this is why. But here are a couple of things that maybe you haven't thought about yet that, that could be really interesting. So it starts with really understanding what their focus and priority is. That sometimes also defines the long list of things you look at. Sometimes they actually have crops or, or uh, sectors that they have always wondered about, and there's really no reason why that shouldn't be on our long list to look at. And then engaging them as, as the results start coming out, uh, both on the viability as well, obviously very importantly on that policy analysis. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So connecting international firms to a public local service provider for a local PPP. Um, I don't think we've done that. Um, we have in, you know, in some cases linked to sort of um, certification, possibly yes. Um, so certain products needing to be certified in a particular way or needing to meet certain phytosanitary requirements where the, um, th there's a public testing or public certification, um, but it, th that is not necessarily a, a PPP. That is more of understanding each of the steps that need to happen and making sure that you are compliant, both locally and internationally. Um, Great. If I, Thank if you. I um, staying on the, the, the local theme, we have a couple questions about developing uh, local, actors, local partnerships. Then definitely, yes. Um, so, um, you have, and, uh, and, from Abdullah, you know, do you have any examples of connecting example international we firms to a public local service provider sort of for a local public-private partnership? Um, and and in Chantal that also step, reflected um, on that, um, for example, asking how a, private sector um, investment is applied that, to local partnerships. Um, currently grows button mushrooms Caroline, would you like to take that? exports them regionally. One of the opportunities we had identified were higher value uh, mushroom types like shiitake, for example. Um, for export to the European market and the local mushroom farm uh, was approached and, and sort of conversations were being brokered with international investors and uh, international export from another region with these mushrooms and the local mushroom farm. So it's definitely um, seeking to build on, on what is already there, obviously to um, sort of, you know, strengthen what's there, but also um, uh, build on, on, on experience. But as I said earlier, it doesn't necessarily have to. You can come up with, with new opportunities. I hope that answers those questions. Absolutely. Yes, of course. So, um, it, it, you know, there's there's some interesting philosophical debates that we had about about some of these, um, and I'll I'll give you um, a, a bit of that, and then I'll I'll also talk about um, a portfolio approach and diversification as a as an angle to to resilience and and improved nutrition. So, particularly when it comes to improved nutrition. Um, there's two ways to look at this. Like one is um, we want to ultimately you want to impact people's diet and you want to make sure that people eat a more nutritious and diverse diet. 
And they can do that either by growing it and then consuming what they grow or consuming what um, their, their neighbors grow. We have a, um, another a very question. We have one from Tim or Quick. They can um, do that. Do you consider the other two global food income, security strategy um, objectives combined with knowledge resilience and improved nutrition, nutrition in addition to agriculture led economic kind of growth when evaluating potential investment? And Caroline, could you talk about how we integrate that, that we're taking in the investment resilience approach, and improved nutrition? We definitely have that these are priorities um, for USA the future. Say, These are considered sure that the that um, in our investments and, and evaluated. That are in this are so, Caroline, would you like to um, found so that they can again, um, start to deploy that towards important areas in their lives, improved nutrition being one, health, education, etc. Obviously, that doesn't go out of its own accord. Um, so, when when an improved um, uh, livelihood, improved disposable income is achieved. Um, there also needs to be uh, both knowledge of and access to improved nutritional products, which is not necessarily automatically achieved by investment opportunities. So this is not a be-all and all silver bullet to that. Um, but we do believe if you think sort of the theory of change around this, that improving people's disposable income is an important lever towards um, ensuring both food security as well as uh, improved nutrition. The other angle to this when it comes to resilience, and, and this is something that um, is both sort of by design and um, a practical necessity, is that what you often think about how do we bring, um, and particularly in an in-grower and outgrower setup, how do you bring um, fundamentally subsistence farmers into some of this? And it's not by saying, stop growing all these things that you eat and completely start growing this passion fruit or chilies or uh, ginger and export it internationally and then you know you, you can buy everything that you need that that is not a um that is not a human-centered transi transition that is not how people make decisions and we all know sort of tran transitioning from subsistence to uh to a to commercial farmer is a is a very very big shift so often operators that work these kind of schemes um, ask people to deploy part of their land for these kind of crops or part of their time for labor on their uh, farms so that people still have partially their, their subsistence farms and you can make that transition smoother and you can also secure some of that security of supply because they continue to be partially subsistence. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, and I mean, the answer is so contextual. Um, right? it, it, it would be, um, I would be really amiss if I tried to say, well, this is the one answer to that situation. Um, so let me go back to, um, to Northern Uganda as the example I, I, managed, I mentioned earlier. Northern Uganda has, um, because of the Civil War history, it has uh, very weak local structures and it has uh, huge land tenure issues, both because there is um, a lot of uh, um, community land holding and, and traditional land holding, but also because people were displaced during the war, they're only now going back, or they make a claim on a land where they were displaced to, multiple people have claims to multiple pieces of land, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and in that particular situation, um, the the, the people that are running these, and as I said earlier, they're not ready for commercial scale investment, but Great. these viable have a question from Mark Hendy. Some, How is some the sort of best way to attract um, they've all investment in a vulnerable community where farmers associations is not a might be weak and, and there is a land not, issue, I'm going to get but there is also a huge market and potential I'm going to farm at a large scale and I'm community. going to process and export. Um, all of the, the people, the, the, the viable businesses we found there, um, work with uh, a aggregation type scheme or an outgrower type scheme where they provide the, um, the aggregation, the processing. So for example, a local uh, sunflower oil manufacturer um, does, the, uh, does the, the pressing and does the refining and the packaging and the selling, uh, but they don't own big tracts of land on which they grow the sunflower seeds uh, because that is just really difficult to secure in that environment. 
And it also has led those firms that have tried to do it um, have met a lot of resistance from communities because land was the only thing that communities had. And even if they sold it, even if they were paid for it, they still felt that they, they weren't sufficiently included and they, it wasn't a fair deal to them. So it, it really depends very, very strongly on the local situation. Sometimes it leads to that conclusion of, I have to be the aggregator, the processor, the exporter, and I'm going to buy either from the local market or from outgrowers. Um, can can be uh, people that I supply with inputs, or it can just be uh, I'm buying on the local market. There's all sorts of variations, but it really depends on the local situation and how you can create um, a viable and safe and sustainable model. There were literally uh, plenty of examples in northern Uganda where harvests were destroyed by angry communities who felt that the the, the larger scale farms um, had not done them justice. And that obviously is not a viable, very viable opportunity. Now, that being said, um, you can understand that from an investor perspective that that poses constraints. Right? If I have, if I'm an agnostic investor and I can go into any um, crop or any geography in the world, I'm unlikely to go into these fragile states where land is a massive issue. If I have uh, an opportunity somewhere else where land is not a massive issue and, and the risk profile is very different. So that then comes back to that um, articulation of really having to find the investors who have a tie to that particular region or particular country and are, have a propensity to focus there and not anywhere else. So that matching of what an investor is looking for and what an opportunity can offer is really important in this situation. So again, and I'm sorry, uh, like, you know, my answer to many of these questions is going to be it depends, but I, I hope that everybody on this on this call also sort of appreciates the importance of con context and, and um, context specific answers. Um, so, yeah, it really depends on how much that is needed, um, how much there is a need for that business development uh, support, if there is a need for it. Um, and you can find an investor and an investee that are willing to work on that, you obviously want to bring those partners into the mix. If you can make an investment opportunity work without needing to have extensive business development support, that is easier and it's it's an easier opportunity to sell and you probably want to do that. So so it's again that, that balance that we spoke about earlier already between sort of maximizing the commercial attractiveness of it whilst also making sure that you constantly pull towards uh, inclusivity. Um, but you don't want to the next question is from Phil. Things. So what balance are you striking between direct kind of implementation go, and partnering is, with a private sector you know, actor in, in that Rwanda, focuses on business development support, beans, including market mapping, linkages, export beans, support, and product similar support? Similar-ish from a um, sort of pro like agricultural processes Caroline. perspective, and they already had access to export markets and um, they already, you know, were selling their French beans to Europe and the buyers of French beans also buy snow peas. So it made a lot of sense to actually work with that actor and find an investor that was willing to back their growth. Then you don't have to make it more complex. But in areas where there is a, a big potential opportunity, but there is not an operator that is ready to take that on and to absorb it, um, but you can make it viable through business development support, etc then you bring those actors into the mix. Yeah, very good question. So, <clears throat> you know, there's um, some so some of the ways like there's 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 different levels there. Um, in some instances, um, inclusivity is actually part of the attractiveness of the opportunity. Um, and these are these are niche, and and we need to recognize that. But 
there is obviously a market for fair trade, for organic, etc. So if we find that the that the base product is um, viable, then you in some markets you can charge a pretty big premium for explicit inclusivity. So sometimes inclusivity is actually the core of the business model. For some other products, and we weigh this in into the equation when we look at at products and services uh, uh, and, and looking at crops. For some other products and crops. <clears throat> Inclusivity is kind of almost comes at very little cost. Thanks. So there are some crops we have another that are question very about inclusivity uh, from um, Kuzia. What are some of the ways to incentivize the private sector to, be, to make uh, their business models more inclusive? Um, and, uh, and how do you create sustainable mechanisms to that continue to benefit to the poor really beyond well, the support so of the program? That's a super labor-intense crop um, that doesn't require super highly skilled laborers to do so. So if you took that to a large scale, it has an immediate job creation opportunity. So we're looking at those kind of things to um, pick the ones that, that come naturally with that inclusivity or inclusivity is hardly at, a, at an extra cost that is, that is really attractive. As soon as you start going beyond that and you say, well, inclusivity would come at a significant cost and it reduces, um, reduces the commercial attractiveness then you may need to start thinking about straight up um, incentives in terms of um, subsidy. Um, there are other other parts. Of, of course, you can put in sort of minimum regulatory requirements. Uh, sometimes it's it's basically the risk profile, as I was just talking about in North Uganda. Like nobody runs a non-inclusive business because your crops get burnt. <laughs> um, but if you don't have those sort of basic uh, levels and, and with regulatory requirements, you have to be careful because you don't want a country to put such high requirements that there are no viable opportunities left because nobody's going to come in if it's not viable, no matter how sort of inclusive it is. Um, so those are all the sort of so the different parts. So sometimes it is actually core of the business model and you don't need to do anything about it. In some other occasions, it comes with very little additional cost and maybe what you do is um, making sure that the private actor understands that maybe there's some degree of um, education, um, some degree of sort of helping identify the people that the private sector could could work with, just to get them over that um, that that hump. Uh, but then once that is running, uh, it doesn't come at any any additional cost. Sometimes it's a regulatory requirement or a, like a basic business risk. And if all of that fails and inclusivity is a substantial extra cost, then you have to start thinking about, is there a way that I can subsidize that? So it could also be um, government, government is often a big buyer of many of these products for, you know, to feed their prison system, to feed their um, army for, for food in schools, in hospitals, et cetera. And government can make choices around we want that to be local, we want that to be of a certain level of inclusivity and can choose to pay a premium for that. Now, that's not easy for local government buyers on a very, very tight budget, but sometimes the World Food Program does that, for example. So it's thinking about sort of where, first, all of those other steps that I mentioned, and then if you're left with inclusivity comes at an extra cost, then you start thinking about, is there anybody paying a premium for that? If not, how can I subsidize this? Absolutely, yes. Um, so the example that we worked on the most and it's the most advanced is the sunflower um, oil example that I mentioned in Tanzania, uh, where it's an import substitution play. Um, we're also looking uh, right now in uh, Guinea at Fonio, both for the local market and for exports. And I can give a, a bunch of other examples. I think when I take a step back and I look at sort of the methodological approach there and the things to keep in mind, it's interesting when we think about domestic consumption because there I, and I mentioned this very early when I spoke about the objectives <clears throat> apologies um, domestic consumption can either come from import substitution so we're, we're currently importing it but actually we could grow it nationally 
um, or increased consumption. And increased consumption can come from either a growing population or a growing consumption per capita. Great. We have a and question from Lacey. Through a lot of, of the examples given so as you far relate to international exports, which do not necessarily increase the availability or affordability of nutritious foods in change. country. Are it there more examples of driving domestic focused one business more opportunities? More of a particular product than they do right now. And changing diets, as many of us on this call probably know, is one of the hardest things to do. So as you think about um, investment opportunities for a national market, it is important to think about which of these am I kind of anchoring on, which is going to be the driver of my demand. Because if the driver of demand is a diet change, that is a lot harder to present as an immediately viable investment opportunity because there's that important thing of behavior change that is out of the control of an investor. So that often then needs to come with either it's a different type of operator or investor that's interested in, or it needs to come with a combined program around information on nutrition and diet, etc. But many, many emerging economies import a lot of agricultural products. So this import substitution play is actually a really interesting one to look at because not only will it um, create viable investment opportunities, livelihood opportunities, and um, sort of increase in GDP, but it will also lessen the burden on Forex, which many countries really, really struggle with. <laughs> yeah, another great question. Um, so when we say do not try to be comprehensive, we don't say come in with a tunnel vision. But what we say is um, like, it's basically you go step by step with an increased level of depth. So your first understanding of the situation, you do need to understand sort of the various aspects of a, of, of, of a crop. So to make that very simple, when we look at the commercial analysis of crop, um, of, of uh, for example, exporting, um, we say, what does it cost to grow this crop? Uh, what does it cost to uh, transport it to the harbor or airport? What does it cost to package and, um, and, and test, etc.? And then what does it cost to transport it to your market of destination? And does the sum of that, um, is that higher or lower than the Our landed uh, wholesale cost Carl. in your, um, um, so in your market of destination? What Carl and you that spoke is, about before, um, to from an not try to be comprehensive and analyzing analysis, the problems, but, we, but understand really the context. Roughly um, and high level. You're how not going to go into too. an immense amount of depth on the farm gate price and understanding all of the differences in the different regions, et cetera, because the first question you're trying to answer is, does it even add up? Is there potential for margin? And if you're finding there's not, then you can start looking at each of the ones. Is there any way that I can that I can change these dramatically? So the, the way you get to that binding constraint question is by analyzing, sorry, I'm, I'm gesturing, which I realize doesn't help <laughs> because you can't see me, but analyzing sort of the, the, the full system, but at a relatively um, high abstraction level to identify the key pain point and then uh, going one level down within that key, key pain point. And again, you do that same thing. You go one level deeper in your analysis, all aspects of that key pain point until you found the thing that really hurts within that, et cetera, et cetera. So that way you avoid coming in with an ingoing assumption and a tunnel vision and you're missing out on, on what's actually happening, but you're also avoiding a X month value chain analysis that understands all of the intricacies and all of the different problems and all of the details only to find out that only one or two are truly the ones that make a difference to viability or not.
All right, and we're going to start to wrap up um, our webinar, and Adam is putting up polls for you all um, to answer. And so, so please, as we um, start to conclude, please answer the polls. And I'd like to ask Asua and John if you'd like to reflect on any of the questions or add any concluding thoughts as well. Thanks, Janet. This is Alpha speaking. So I think what I've heard from a lot of the questions is really this focus on understanding kind of how to ensure that in doing this work, we're not purely focused on, um, you know, kind of profit, engaging with companies at the expense of smallholders, ignoring gender, not recognizing some of the nuance of um, advancing nutritional outcomes, et cetera. And I, I think these are all kind of valid concerns. Um, I think something I just wanted to, to reiterate and um, kind of reinforce that Carline has shared is as we begin this process and in every country that we've done it and as we look at all the different um, potential opportunities, the dual lens of commercial viability and development impacts are carried through the process. And so the extent to which um, the focus is on job creation, increasing nutrition, engaging smallholder farmers, engaging female smallholder farmers will differ based on context and product, et cetera. But these are lenses that are, you know, we realize are fundamental to this work. Um, kind of building on that, I think it's also worth calling out um, the reality of uh, the reality of investment, the reality of investors, and where there isn't a viable opportunity, um, regardless of the potential kind of development if I may impact, offer regardless my, of the I, potential I, number of smallholder farmers sorry, that <laughs> sorry, you know, might I be included or the, um, um, the context, as, as it's not going to happen. As become clear so, uh, in this webinar, really we are very, very passionate about it. Who, we, um, uh, we those think we have a set of tools that can be really useful. I was really inspired by many of the questions we got. So I just wanted to reiterate that, really that as I noticed that a lot of the questions and a lot of the comments really do get on that that to be used, refined, um, you know, used and still um, do you have any starts wearing off. That? And um, if we can yeah, be useful in any way to any one of you, let us know. of some key overarching thoughts. I think for, for me to add, uh, I, I would just mention that um, you know the private sector is a wonderful driver of uh, of so much activity in uh, in developing markets. Um, it's better being able to engage, speak the language, uh, be able to um, you know meet them at their level, uh, and and be that uh, to use a different phrase, uh, a, a guiding force towards impact um, is uh, is really uh, I think one of the overarching uh, lessons that we're trying to. Um, uh, to drive towards within these primaries. Um, yeah, that, that process to uh, private sector engagement uh, is, is a long one and, and one that I think has got a lot of benefits. And hopefully this will help uh, through that process. Yeah. Great. 